Well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And as uh, Marquita is getting set up, um, as Blake said, I'm his colleague and cohort over at the Heritage Foundation. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Preservation Education. So tonight we are very pleased to have my colleague, um, Dr. Marquita Reed Wright, who holds a PhD in public history at Middle Tennessee State University. Additionally, Marquita received her BA in history from Florida State University and an MA in public history from Florida International University. Working with numerous historical organizations such as MTSU Center for Historic Preservation and Fisk University Library and Special Collections, Marquita has a background in education, collections management, curatorial management, and exhibit design. Areas of research include 20th century African American history, popular culture, material culture, and museology. Marquita started working with the National Museum of African American Music as an intern in 2016. And she went on to continue her work with NMAAM in 2017, first as a graduate resident, then as the collections manager. And now she is serving as the collections manager, archivist, and gallery manager for the National Museum of African American Music. And we are thrilled to have you with us tonight, Marquita. And I'm so excited to- Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank yes. you. So take it away. Okay, hi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, I am also in my home. Um, <laughs> so it's gonna be a little echoey in here. Um, so tonight I just wanted to talk about the museum a little bit. First, give a little overview of our museum um, and then talk more about some of the objects we have in our museum and how they are helping us tell the story of African American history and music within the museum. One of the things that we tried to do when we started collecting for the exhibit was to make sure we had harmony within our collections. Um, as many of you may know, um, the museum was supposed to be built on Jefferson Street. Um, when, they were, when the concept came about 20 years ago, they were thought Jefferson Street, Jefferson Street would be there. We're not on Jefferson Street that has created a bit of a rift in the community and they have questioned that in the black community, why is the museum not on Jefferson Street? Um, we do think our location is a very prime location and we love what we are. We're right across from the Ryman, right across from Bridgestone, right down the street from Country Music Hall of Fame. So one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to build a collection that one, spoke to the narrative and two, created harmony, harmony within the collection with the community. Our mission has always been to educate the world, preserve the legacy, and celebrate the central role of Af African Americans play in creating the American soundtracks. While doing that and developing the Rivers of Rhythm corridor and interactive, we wanna think of ways we can do that. And one of the ways we're doing that is through our collections and what we have collected and what's on display and what we will continue to collect in the future. The objects in our museum make us think and they're thought provoking. And we thought about who the community was and who we we're trying to speak to. When I say community, I don't just mean the Nashville community, I mean the larger national community and also the community of African-Americans that helped create this music and the culture. So we'll start in our way in the Water Gallery, which is our gallery that focuses on spirituals and gospel music. In this gallery, two of the objects I wanted to pick out and focus on were one, the Roberta Martin Singer's songbook, and second, the Fairfield Four performance costume. We believe that these two objects really do speak to what we're trying to do within each gallery and in the museum and narrative. They speak to the narrative because the Roberta Martin Singers were a very popular group started by Roberta Martin in the 1930s. We all know as Thomas Dorsey as the father of gospel music, but there were others who came after him. And what makes Roberta Martin so important is that they also started their own publishing company. So everything, every song they wrote, whatever they published, it was by their own company and they printed it and distributed it themselves. Which is very important because it once again gets back to talking about the community. The community that created this music, made this music and shared this music. A lot of you may know, or if not, the Fair for Four 
um, they were actually, they became really famous again after their performance and Old oh Brother Were Out Thou um, in the early 2000s um, when they sung the song Lonesome Valley. They are also from Nashville. And this once again gets it back to that question of how are we going to bring Nashville and Nashville community into the museum? And this is one of the ways we did that. We um, went to the fair from four and we asked them for costumes or performance, uh, anything performance related, but they were very gracious. They, um, the group gave us four outfits and two Grammys that we now have in our collection and that are periodically going to be on display in the museum. Another way we were able to bring the community into the museum and also teach and give the audience something fun to do while learning was our Nashville Super Choir Interactive. Our Nashville Super Choir Interactive focuses on teaching, um, learning how to sing, call and response. It's with Dr. Bobby Jones, this Nashville Super Choir. He will come on screen and lead you in the call and response of a happy day. And as you're saying on happy day, you're learning about call and response. At the end of it, you actually get to see yourself on screen with the super choir. All the people are from Nashville. We have had um, some tours come in. I've led some tours of people. And the one thing they say is, I know that person or that person or this many people in the choir. And they feel more of a connection to the museum as well. And that we're creating a narrative that speaks to community and to the local community and to the national community as well. Our next gallery would be Crossroads. One of the hardest parts about collecting for this gallery was finding a lot of tangible material from artists. As we know, some of the early artists that were creating blues didn't leave a lot of tangible material, especially African-American artists. We wanted to, one, focus on the development of the blues. And one of the things that we did, which you can see in the background, in our first case when you come into the gallery, those are all objects that were made and that we collected, or we had one of the objects, the banjo. Um, it is recreation of one of the first board banjos that was made, and we had it reproduced for us for the museum. One of the object objects that we feel really represents what we're trying to do in creating harmony within collections in the museum is this ironing board keyboard by Ironing Board Sam. Um, ironing Board Sam is a blues artist. He's not well known by a lot of people who aren't really steeped in the blues, but when we talk about reaching out to the community, not just within Nashville, but outside of Nashville, we teamed up with Music Makers Foundation and Mr. Tim Duffy. And he has been introducing us to a lot of maybe lesser known blues and bluegrass artists, but we're creating connection with them and talking to them and letting them know that their material, their objects, the things that they've created, their music, they're important and we want to preserve them. And this can be a place that they can, you know, donate to because we would take care of their objects and present them in the way that would talk about them and their life. One of the things that we do like to say about our museum, we're not just a hall of fame and we're not just gonna collect objects from very famous artists, which we would still love those, but there are also a community of independent artists and less known artists that speak to the narrative. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do. Within this gallery, the interactive we have is the learning to play the blues interactive well, you get to build your own blues song um, and it teaches you the format of blues songs and you get to choose a character. And this was actually created by the team. You know, we had to sit down, hand write it and everything you see on screen matches with the environment and the time period. And we also have a rotate, uh, a film of the Great Migration that plays and it's on a loop. Um, one of these things about the film is that in this gallery, we really focus a lot on the great migration and the way music moved, you know, from the South to the West, North, Midwest, 
um, in only using photographs that were collected or we found to make the movie and you can see it when you come into the museum. I Love Supreme Gallery is our jazz gallery. And this gallery actually houses one of my favorite objects that I'm very glad we were able to have in our collection. Once again, it's speaking to the community, reaching out to the African-American community of musicians and saying, hey, we want to preserve your items. We want to tell your story. We want to be a loudspeaker and asking them what they want us to talk about and tell and what objects they have that they're very important to them. This is a trombone from Helen Jones Woods. Um, she is the mother actually of Kathy Hughes. They donated this object um, about a year before Ms. Woods, Mrs. Woods passed away. Um, she was a part of the International Sweethearts of Rhythm, which was an all women's international jazz band. They traveled through the 1930s, 1940s. Um, I really love this object and appreciate it because one, we get to talk about women within the narrative and what their experience in jazz and also the experience of women who came from small towns who traveled and really get to focus in on a band that may have been less known again, but they speak to and they have stories about their travels. Um, one of the things this trombone was able to help us with was to learn more about traveling for an inter interracial group, a band around the South. They have stories about how they had to sleep in some hotel rooms, how some of them actually had to sleep on the bus because they were white women, black women, Native American women and Asian women. Um, and they tell the difference between being here in the US and being abroad and playing. And this is just a really beautiful instrument. And we're actually in the process of talking to more former members of International Sweethearts of Rhythm to collect other objects and instruments from the band, including some bandstands and another trombone. Within this gallery, the interactive that we have, which is very fun to play with is anyone can improvise. Um, it's a touch screen that plays you a melody and you get to pick your instrument, whether it be a trombone, clarinet or saxophone and you get to improvise within the melody. And, and when you're done, it'll record it for you and play it back to you. Um, our One Nation Undergroove Gallery is our biggest gallery that we have because it encompasses so much. It covers R&B, soul, neo-soul, pop. Talk a little bit about K-pop. Um, just all uh, many genres fall under One Nation Undergroove. This is the gallery. We do have a lot of objects from a lot of famous artists. But one of the things we wanted to focus on once again was community and how they built this music. One object in here that is very interesting is a bandstand from the Johnny Otis show. Johnny Otis um, in the 1950s and 60s was very well known R&B world and actually was an A&R rep for King Records and discovered many different artists. And he actually helped write Hound Dog and produce it, um, the first version of it. And we also have in this collection a Fender Rhodes bass, which was donated by Dr. Carl Malsby. He is a professor and he taught music and he also played music in bands. What's very important about this bass is that anyone who remembers Donny Hathaway and the sound and synthesizers and everything was created when he started his records, this is where that comes from. And it gives us a chance to dig deeper into the creation of that sound and that different type of sound that came out in the 70s, and especially Donny Hathaway. We also have another interactive in this gallery. It's called Let's Make a Hit. Um, this digs deeper into being producer. And around here also, we have a whole wall where we talk about a and people and producers, and we dig deeper into African-Americans with 
in and behind the scenes of music. So we talk about some of some people whose names you won't even know, but they helped find Michael Jackson or they wrote that song or produced that song that made him famous on um, that the Thrill album, which blew up. We talk about them and dig deep into their experience in the music industry. We have a video that plays in a loop and we're actually in the process again of writing a new narrative to do more interviews for more people in the field because we right now it's from 1950s through the early 1990s we want to go from the 1990s to present day and discover more of those stories through oral histories and interviews. The Let's Make a Hit Interactive lets you take the seat of a producer actually, and you pick different sounds, instruments, and at the end of it, it comes all together and it creates a music demo for you. And it'll tell you what your sound sounds like. Are you a Philadelphia sound? Are you more of hit maker, hit maker sound? Motown sound, and it'll present you with a list of songs that you can actually save on your RDF eye bracelet that you'll get when you visit the museum, and you can take it home with you. The Message Gallery um, is also, the hip, it's a hip hop gallery. It's also one of our biggest galleries that we do have, um, along with One Nation, because this becomes more contemporary and we dig into um, more contemporary issues. But one of the biggest things about this gallery is that we are very focused on the culture of hip hop that came out of hip hop. We are very much focused on the commodification of hip hop and talking about how not only hip hop tells a story, but also the business behind hip hop and rap and how it's evolved since the 1970s to the present day. You know, Jay-Z just sold a company that he still has stock in, you know, and that's different from when you had first artists coming out who didn't even own their rights to their songs. So in here we have a Troop Jacket, which was a company in the 1980s. It is the front company now, we're not a business, but this is a very popular jacket during that time that people would wear and some artists such as LL Cool J used to represent this company in their jackets. We also have a turntable that is representative of some of the turntables that were first used by artists when they were going to house parties. Um, I really think these objects and more objects like this really speak to the culture of hip hop and really help tell us, help us tell the story in a narrative of hip hop that sometimes can get lost. But I'd like to tell people, hip hop created its own, hip hop and rap has created its own culture with fashion, with lingo. And so that has to be represented here. One thing that we just got in was someone sent in a pair of gold hip hoop earrings and a picture of them wearing it at um, one of their first concerts. Um, I think it was a salt and pepper concert that she went to. And, you know, we hope to display that soon and to talk more about people's experiences within the music. Um, this gallery is does end more in present day. I just talk more about the commodification of hip hop and rap and how different the ways of artists are going, uh, especially with sound. Uh, but I think we hope, we're hoping to get in a few more items in here. We also have a pair of Yeezys in here um, that are curated collected for us to represent more of the fashion of hip hop and how hip hop fashion is changing and how um, a lot of artists are at the forefront of that. So what is the future of our collections and where does this leave us? Well, the primary focus of Name M Collection is for interpretation, education, exhibition. It supports the museum's mission and serves to realign the mission as the collection grows or as collection opportunities arise. So we have been working on a new, a new collections plan. We already have a policy. We're working on a plan. And one of the things that we want to do, um, we want to collect more of Nashville music history. We do see that, although we have tried, there is a gap that we have in telling the Nash, especially the African-American Nashville music history story. 
we want to tell more of the Jefferson Street story. We want to tell this story. We want to be able for the community to come to us and feel comfortable with us housing and sharing their stories. We also will start collecting more music technology. Um, we'll also start adding to our archive, archives, collecting more photos, flyers, visual images, hand bills, sheet music, and audio, and visual audio as well. This is actually one of our newest acquisitions um, in our collection. This is from Demetra Ch Chavis. Her daddy, her dad, her father was Chuck Chavis. He was a director of the TSU All Coll Collegiate Jazz Band. This is the brass section. He was also the director of the TSU band. Um, this is very important to us because we were talking about collecting more natural history and she came to us with a box of photos. And they're just her dad with different band members through the 1940s and 50s and 60s. And we recently, we've been added to our collection and this is one of the projects that we will be working on when we get an intern, digitizing these and actually finding the names, if we can, of the people in the band. We also will collect more classical music by African-Americans and things that they were featured in. This is one that we have also collected and added to our collection. We also plan to collect more spirituals and sheet music because we have looked and found that there isn't a large collection, a lot of archives of African-American spirituals, sheet music and gospel. And so where we see that gap, we want to fill it. And speaking of music technology, we just had a player piano come in two days ago um, that someone called and they said they were moving and they didn't know what to do with it and they went to donate to the museum. And this is the direction we're going. We now have a player piano and we're getting ready to add to our collection a 1968 Seberg jukebox. And we're also going to add more music technology such as Walkmans and phonographs into our collection as well. We're hoping to collect these from the community, from people around and I have to um, buy them an auction um, because we feel like each object comes with a story. Um, even this object came with a story that we want to, you know, when we a section and add it to that because it is a part of its history. It gives me immense pleasure to say that the National Museum of African American Music is finally complete and ready to open to the public. We now have a place where young black children can see people who look like them venerated and celebrated as the icons they are. Namam is the personification of One Nation Under a Groove. This is a place for everyone, where we want people from all walks of life to come to learn and play, and where we can celebrate our common humanity.
That's the end of that presentation. Um, I try to make it as short as possible um, because I want to have time for questions. And also um, I want to talk more about the direction of our archives right now um, and what we're looking for and what we're trying to do. Um, so if Biden has, has questions first, I will happily take questions. Yeah, just unmute yourself if you've got a question um, and ask. And Marquita, this is Rachel. How long uh, did it take to actually get the museum to be where it is today? Doors open, people coming in. How how long was that process from, from vision process. from vision to execution? <laughs> okay, it started in 1990. The vision oh came about in the yeah, 1990s. Um, Francis Guest had the vision and it was originally just going to be uh, an African-American history, arts and culture museum. That's what it's gonna be called. And then it changed over time and it became the National Museum of African-American Music. Um, so it's it's been a while um, since the 1990s. It really got off the ground in the early 2000s. Okay. And then it really hit the ground running when the deal was made to have the museum on Broadway. Um, we, the, we were offered a $1 lease <laughs> um, uh, to be the anchor for that um, whole establishment. Because as you know, it's a mixed use. They're right. gonna be a, shop, a shopping center, uh, apartments. Restaurants and things like that. Restaurants right? yeah. and stuff around there. And we are, go we are the anchor to all of that. So we took the offer and went with it. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so um, well COVID did, yeah, COVID did <laughs> slow us down a bit. We were supposed to open last year. Right, um, right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, things happened and, but we finally opened our doors in January. I just, so, what is, oh, I'm no. Sorry. oh, no, no, no. Ellen. Uh, is that who was wanting to speak? Whomever that was, speak up, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, this is Beth. I, I just okay. wanna thank you so much. I'm, I'm just tickled that we have this museum in Music City. It's not a complete Music City without this. And um, I'm, I serve on the CVB along with Barry for Williamson County Tourism, but I'm kind of interested if in Nashville, they're going to combine this museum with other you know, museums and venues. So when our tourists come to Nashville, they'll have that introduction to, you know, to attend this museum along with everything else that's already been featured. Yes, um, we actually gave a tour to um, some people who work for Tennessee State Tourism. Right. Um, they were very excited um, and, and wanted to know more. So I believe we will be a part of that. Um, hopefully we, we should be a part of that. Um, so yeah, and I, I saw the question about Depeche Mode being in the yes. museum. Yes, and that is because we we do have artists that are not African American in the museum. Um, one of the reasons we have that is because we're showcasing the influence that African Americans have had on so many artists and creation of sound, and how other we have K-pop in the a uh, K-pop poster in the museum. It's a really small picture of a K-pop band, but we have that. But that's showing this sound created by African-Americans and that influence and that American sound, how far it goes and how many people are incorporated into their sound and, and using it. Marquita, this is Robert Blair. You, What days are you currently open and are memberships available? Yes, memberships are available. I could not find our membership slide, I'm sorry, but I knew someone asked. Um, so we are currently open to Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays, but starting 
next week, actually. We are Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays. And tickets are actually already on sale for March. All tickets are timed. Um, there are always going to be timed tickets because um, we're saying 90 minutes is sort of a minimum to get through the museum. There are lots of interactives, even some I didn't talk about. And we have uh, Roots and Streams Interactive, which even I get stuck at sometimes because I'm learning something new. Um, you go to the interactive within each gallery and you click on the artist. So for instance, if you go to the Wade in the Water Gallery, um, gospel arts will pop up first, a little wheel, and you click on one and it'll show you at the top influencers, at the bottom peers, on the side who they were influenced by. And then you also click on their name, this little plus sign, and the bio will come up. So you can read through their bio. But you can also click on each artist that popped up. So you can spend time, so much time there getting lost in finding out who your favorite artist was influenced by, who they influenced, some of their new songs. Like I never knew um, Ty Tribbett. Like I, I like his music, but I never knew one of the first songs I heard from him was on the Prince of Egypt album when I was a kid. And I didn't know that until I went through and I played with Interactive. And then I clicked on other artists who were like him and I found some, okay, some other artists that I could be interested in as well. Um, membership are at different levels. Um, you have your student at 25, individual at 50, you have senior membership, and you also have family membership, which is $100. Um, and we do encourage buying memberships. We have had plenty of people who do live in the area who want to come back and said, it takes a long time to get the museum because there's a lot of content. So other, other than paying $26 every time you come, you have a membership. And you do get to keep um, your RDFI bracelet or get a new one when you come. And it hooks up to your email address. You put your email address in. In each interactive you're at, you get to save whatever you create and listen to. Um, every time you click on a song, it says save playlist and you get to save that song and it will pop up in your email um, a few hours later when you go home. Thank you. Even the, uh, in even all the uh, beats you create, um, both creating beats and hip hop. The only thing you cannot save is your uh, rap along because that is copyrighted. Um, or in some of the rap battle, what, some of those songs are copyrighted as well. Um, but other than that, you can save everything. So you said 90 minutes minimum, um, but how long do you recommend to really absorb it? And what, what do you think? Um, I would say you would probably need about a good two hours and some change for me anyway. Um, but that's just because I, I go through it almost every day and keep playing with this. Well, our IT person wants me to keep playing with everything to make sure it works. So I get stuck at something sometimes. Um, but yeah, in plus we're, we're factoring in um, how many people will be in there and wanting to um, interact with all interactives as well. Our two of the busiest ones are the rap booth and singing with the gospel choir. Those both have lines. Plus we only are allowing two people in at a time, or if your party is there, you in with your party only because of COVID restrictions. So it's taking a little longer for people to go through the museum because of that. So that's why we're saying it, it was gonna take you some time. Yeah. And um, I saw where you park, there is an underground garage that you pull into. Um, if you're on Broadway, you can pull in off of six in Broadway, or you can pull in off of fifth in commerce. Um, there are two garages you can, two interweights to the garages you can use. You take the elevator up and it will take you to Broadway and you walk around to the front of the museum. Yes, COVID has impacted the acquisition uh, process. Um, because we're finding a lot of people, you know, they don't want us to come into their homes um, as freely now. Also moving objects, um, going to meet a potential donor to get an object is not as easy. We have had some um, requests from different places, especially after we open. And there used to be a time before we open where we would get 
on, I got on a plane once and went to LA to meet um, Mr. Mr. Westbrook, who donated a lot of um, signs uh, from his record company to us. And I went out to LA to his um, warehouse, just look at them. And I did that like that. Now it's, we can't do that. And we are finding that a lot of older people, they have to get someone to help them use technology so we can do it, you know, over FaceTime or send us pictures and stuff like that. So the acquisition process is just very, it's slower than it was before COVID. Marquita, I have another question. Yes. Uh, what would you say is the most popular exhibit right now or most popular stop inside of an exhibit? Because I haven't been able to visit yet, but we're bringing the kids very soon. And I saw that there is an interactive or some, what looks like Prince is on the wall. And two okay. of my kids are Prince fans. So okay, that is <laughs> very excited takeover. about that. That is our Rivers of Rhythm takeover moment. Um, we have three of those. Okay. And one is Prince at the Super Bowl. Um, when you're standing okay. in Rivers of Rhythm, what happens is, you know, as you're playing with interactive, it happens every 50 minutes. You, um, everything go off. You can't play with interactive anymore because they want your attention to the walls. The walls are about 13 feet high on each side. And the performances are on all the walls. Um, and everything, all, even all the, the intro videos to each gallery shut down, everything's quiet and that's, that's all there is playing is that performance. And we have the Prince performance, we have a James Brown performance that plays. Um, and they're meant for people to, you know, dance if they want to just enjoy it and enjoy the music. So that's, that's one of the things we have. A lot of people, when they come in, they don't know about it, so when it happens, like, well, when can I catch it again? I'm like, I'm sorry. It only happens like every 50 minutes and it's always <laughs> a different one. They rotate. So, okay. yeah, but we're hoping to add more. Um, right now we only have three, but we really want to add more. But um, one of the things I didn't talk about was licensing. Yeah. We, yeah, for our museum, Expensive. it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> um, and not just the monetary cost of it, it's just the process of licensing. Um, every week, even now, we're still going through clearance issues. Mm -hmm. um, and we're finding that clearance, we have gotten some things for now that we're open, they're approaching us again, wanting to already renew those things and asking for more money. So we do have um, Dr. Lewis, he, he handles that, like, what's one of his full-time jobs is to handle licensing. Um, there, I can replay the intro video, um, but it's not, it, it's not anywhere online anywhere, I don't think, um, at right now. Um, do I need to replay it? I, there was a sound not off when it, was a sound not on when it first started playing, I'm sorry. That's okay, um, I think we, would everybody appreciate seeing the full video again? I know we only got about maybe three full minutes of the 10 minute video, so that might give everybody a a good overview okay. if you wouldn't mind playing it one more time. All right, let me try to open it again. Actually. Let me pause it really quick. Okay, I'm gonna to try to share it with. Hello, and welcome for the first time inside your National Museum of African American Music. With the help of our exceptional curatorial team, we'll walk you through the museum, showcasing our six galleries and the Rivers of Rhythm Interactive, which ties the museum together. And so with that, let's get started. 
Welcome again to your National Museum of African American Music. First up is our curatorial director, Dr. Dina Bennett, with the start of the museum experience. Enjoy. My name is Dr. Dina Bennett, and I'm the curatorial director of the National Museum of African American Music, the first national institution dedicated to studying, preserving, educating, and celebrating more than 50 music genres and subgenres that were created, influenced, and inspired by African Americans. The museum's permanent exhibition is called Rivers of Rhythm, African Americans and the Making of American Music and it features six galleries, Rivers of Rhythm, Wade in the Water, Crossroads, A Love Supreme, One Nation Under a Groove, and The Message. They are designed to take visitors on a chronological journey through the history of African-American music while revealing its many connections to American history and sociocultural movements from the 1600s to the present day. Visitors begin their Rivers of Rhythm journey in the Roots Theater, which sets the stage for the experience. A 15-minute film gives an overview of African-American history, which begins with the institution of slavery in West and Central Africa, and then in America. Because the sacred experiences of African and African-derived peoples are the foundation out of which African-American music emerged, visitors will begin their museum journey in the Wade in the Water Gallery. The area takes its name from the African-American folk spiritual, Wade in the Water. It chronicles the history and influence of religious music from elemental aspects of indigenous African themes that survived during slavery to the formation of African-American spirituals, hymns, and eventually gospel music. This gallery includes two interactive touch points that provide up close and personal encounters with African-American religious music. The first interactive is called Personal Gospel, and it offers an animated stories of faith and inspiration with audio, inviting visitors to experience the power of gospel music on people's lives by telling their own personal stories the second interactive is singing with the choir. It presents an interactive video experience in which visitors sing along with a pre-produced performance of Dr. Bobby Jones and the Nashville Super Choir. The visitor will learn the lyrics and movements of a selected song, experience the engagement and uplifting power of singing with the gospel choir, and experience gospel music as a collective expression of communal participation. The Crossroads Gallery borrows its name from the Crossroad of the Blues, the intersection of highways 49 and 61 in Clarksdale, Mississippi, where legend has it that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil in exchange for an unmatched mastery of the blues. The gallery chronicles the influence and history of the blues, a genre of secular music that arose after the Civil War out of the Black experience in America. Its humble origins are rooted in the 19th century work songs and field haulers sung by sharecroppers and lumber mill workers of the Deep South and the Mississippi Delta in the post-slavery era. Visitors will encounter female blues singers who recorded race records in the 1920s in this gallery. They can explore the influence of the blues on white country music, the rhythm and blues sound of the 1950s, and the blues revival of the 1960s, in which many blues masters were rediscovered by young white audiences in America and in Britain. The narrative ends with a further look into contemporary blues, its modern masters, and its deeply embedded role in diverse forms of music. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Lewis, curator. A Love Supreme traces the history of jazz, beginning with its African roots and its early development in New Orleans. 
From there, we trace jazz's growth and development over the course of the 20th century, discussing topics including the Great Migration, the Harlem Renaissance, jazz in World War II, the birth of modern jazz, and jazz's influence around the world. Some of the artifacts on display in this gallery include one of Louis Armstrong's trumpets, a dress worn by Grammy Award-winning jazz vocalist Dee Dee Bridgewater, and a saxophone owned by contemporary jazz saxophonist Kirk Whalum. The title of this gallery comes from John Coltrane's classic 1960s album, A Love Supreme, which remains one of the most influential jazz recordings in history. In the One Nation Under a Groove gallery, we outline the history of rhythm and blues and African-American popular music that appeared in the years following World War II. We discuss the influence of earlier traditions like jazz and gospel music on R&B and trace the history of the music through the second half of the 20th century into the 21st century. We pay special attention to important historical themes and topics like the civil rights movement, the rise of record labels like Motown and Stax, and the influence of music broadcasting. The title of this gallery comes from One Nation Under a Groove, the hit 1978 album by Funkadelic. The phrase, One Nation Under a Groove, also expresses the broad appeal that African-American music has had across diverse communities. The message tells the story of hip hop from its origins in the South Bronx block parties of the 1970s to its current place as one of the world's most influential musical genres. In the message, we cover topics including the growth of urban youth culture in 1970s New York City, the devastating impact of urban renewal policies on inner city communities, the influence of new technology on music, and the influence of hip hop moguls like Jay-Z, P. Diddy, and Kanye West. This gallery's name comes from The Message, a classic recording by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. For many historians, The Message was the first hip hop recording to feature prominent social and political commentary. The name The Message also evokes hip hop's connection to the African American oral tradition. Welcome to the Rivers of Rhythm Gallery. During the planning and design stage, we identified key messages and thematic goals for the exhibitions and developed a museum concept that would use Rivers of Rhythm as a design metaphor for the permanent galleries. In the Rivers of Rhythm, visitors can explore digital timeline tables that feature touch panel interactives designed to weave together themes that run throughout the museum, placing the African-American music here in context and to show its essential role in shaping our American identity. The timelines draw strong connections between historical events and music and lyrics, significant cultural moments, combine clusters of songs with an interactive playlist that introduces the music of that moment. The gallery's central goal is to help visitors understand how African-American music has intertwined with history and culture to form their American soundtrack. The Rivers of Rhythm Gallery also functions as a performance space for periodic film experiences called Takeover Moments, musical interludes that will be projected on the walls. At timed intervals, the pathway will transform into a fully immersive environment in which lighting, images, and music sync together and envelop visitors in a spectacular transforming musical experience. This interactive will present three takeover moments that feature iconic performances across musical genres. So as you can see, we are all excited. We're just overjoyed to be able to finally share this special place with you. And I can't wait until you're safely able to join us here in person. NAMAM is a place for all of us, all of us to come together, no matter what your background may be, no matter what music you like or where you come from. NAMAM is a place for us to unite behind a common goal, one vision, one song, one museum, one nation under a groove. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Marquita, for playing that one more time. No problem. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions, thoughts, final comments? I have a I question. Know, I can't wait to go see this it. This is Blake. <laughs> 
do, yes. do the uh, do the Fist Jubilee singers play a role in the um in the in the exhibits? And yes. if, if and if they do, do you also talk about some of the other um, historically black colleges that had their own singing troupe? Yes, we do talk about some of them when we have actually um, we have a panel that does talk about some of them in FIS. Our plan is to FIS doesn't take up a huge portion of the panel or the narrative. Um, our plan is to hopefully in the future, FIS will be our first rotating exhibition that we have. Um, we are working, that is in the works right now. We're working on it. I'm um, actually am meeting next week with the archivist there to start working on choosing artifacts that will fit the storyline that we already have written for it. And so um, we want that to be our first rotating exhibit in our temporary gallery that we have um, established. Excellent. Does anyone else have any more questions? Well, I just wondered briefly, what type of things are you doing at the museum just to protect from COVID-19. I know you said time did admission, but you know, just us going somewhere where we probably haven't been before, sometimes you're just a little hesitant. So what yeah. can you assure us of? Okay, um, one, we are not at full capacity at all. And that's why you also have time admission. Um, so we're not at full, full capacity, we have time admission, we have hand sanitizing stations. We actually have volunteers that are standing around because we have so many interactives they are periodically, they're, they're in each gallery cleaning. Um, so it's always like every, I guess, 10, 15 minutes there will be someone cleaning or one of the booths interactives will be shut down for a little bit. So someone go in, clean it and come out. Um, we're also offering disposable stylus for people who do not wanna to touch the screens. Um, you can use your stylus to touch the screen that comes wrapped in a plastic wrap for you and you dispose it when you're done. We're also offering um, disposable headphone covers for our headphones. So those will actually have to touch your skin as well. So we're, we're, we're trying to keep it a safe and fun experience as possible for everyone. Yeah, sounds good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any final questions? No? Well, it's it, it certainly whetted my appetite to uh, to see what's what there in the museum. Um, would really appreciate uh, Dr. Uh, I know we're all interested in getting up there, especially when um, when and things you know calm down, everyone gets their vaccine. Um, but if anyone wants to rewatch this video or share it with someone, we will put this on our YouTube and. Um, hopefully in a couple of days. Um, so uh, appreciate everyone joining us today. Yes. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Reed Wright. We really appreciate you yeah. giving up your time tonight and coming and presenting on no, no problem. the museum. I, yeah. We're very no excited. I hope visit. y'all make it, yeah, soon. It's it's really fun and educational. It is fun and educational. But yes. It does seem like a very fun place to work with all the music. <laughs> it is. We have, a, we have a dance studio we sometimes go in. There's a place there you, you can go. Um, that's one of interact one of interactives is a dance studio that um, different dances throughout five decades. Mm -hmm. So it's seven minutes long, and you should you have to dance the whole time. It's a good workout <laughs> too. Yes, there you go. Yeah, has to be a happy place if that's the case. I would, if we could dance where we work, we probably wouldn't get anything done. <laughs> it's like like you said, you know, work plus play. <laughs> Yes. And education. Yes. And education. Yes, definitely education. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight and for working through our uh, delayed entry into our Zoom presentation. Um, but we hope you'll join us in April when we have Dr. Ashley Boat Knight Claybrooks presenting. Um, and we look forward to coming up to Nashville and visiting the museum. Mm -hmm and learning more about African-American music and their contributions to um, music society and music history. It doesn't stop. It's a circle. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you Have so a great much. night, everyone. Um, you too. Bye. 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 Bye.